Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our second session uh, of the Ambition Institute Summer Series. Uh, this session this afternoon is titled, How Can We Tackle the Disadvantage Gap When Schools Reopen? My name is Sir David Carter, and I'm the Executive Director of System Leadership at Ambition Institute. And I want to offer you a warm welcome to everyone who is joining us this afternoon. My role at Ambition is to lead the programmes that relate to system leadership, for those leaders working across multiple schools or leading academy trusts, we have two programs, executive leaders and trust educators. I've also been responsible for designing and now delivering the Trust Diagnostic Review Program aimed at supporting the self-evaluation of academy trusts across the country. Ambition Institute is an education charity with a mission to help teachers and school leaders to keep getting better, especially those who are working in the most disadvantaged communities. We run professional development programs for every career stage from new teachers all the way through to multi-academy trust CEOs. We're passionate about making sure that children from poorer backgrounds have the same opportunities to succeed as their classmates. And all our work is designed to do this. As Ambition, we want to contribute to the national effort to support schools and teachers beyond our programme delivery. Our summer series is one of the main ways we're going to do this. A series of free webinars open to all teachers and school leaders, regardless of whether you're participants in our programmes or not. This afternoon, we have a fantastic and experienced panel of experts with us, and over 400 of you have chosen to join us. At the end of another busy week, I hope the next hour will be stimulating and will inspire us as we move closer to the start of the weekend. With the disadvantage gap set to widen as a result of the current pandemic crisis, tackling the disadvantage gap when schools reopen is both a timely and important theme for us to explore this afternoon. In the period when I was National Schools Commissioner, I described this work as one of the biggest civil liberty challenges of our lifetime. If you believe, as I do, that any country or organisation should be judged by how well it supports its most vulnerable communities, then we see education playing a massive role in this national priority. And I feel that there are four driving factors this afternoon that are going to inform our debate. We know that for many children and adults, re-engaging in the habits and the behaviours we take for granted in the school culture will be hard. We also know that the learning gaps that were evident on Friday, March the 20th, the last week before the lockdown was announced, will have widened. And we know that these gaps are not exclusively related to academic performance. Talking to academy trust and school leaders over the past month, it's been very clear that the phrase catch up means many different things and that teachers in our profession are thinking incredibly hard about what this means and how to build their plans effectively. And we hope this afternoon that this session will contribute to that. And finally, we will have the challenge of assessing where children are starting from as they begin to come back to our classrooms, bearing in mind that this will have been the longest period of time any cohort of children will have been out of school since the Second World War. Our next session in the summer series on Friday, June the 22nd, between four and five o'clock, will be called How to Assess and Meet Pupils' Needs and be led by Harry Fletcher Wood, and he will address this very issue. It is with all of this in mind that I am so pleased that I'm able to welcome this afternoon five significant people from a range of different professional backgrounds to lead our discussion. And I'm going to introduce them to you in the order that they will speak next. First of all, it's my pleasure to welcome Leora Crudus, who is the CEO of the Confederation of School Trusts. Many of you will be aware of the important work that CST does as a voice for the academy trust sector. Ben Pickering is a humanitarian advisor in the Conflict, Humanitarian and Security Department in the Department for International Development. Ben has managed humanitarian aid projects with organisations that include Oxfam, Save the Children and Médecins Sans Frontières. Ben joins us this afternoon in a personal capacity. Our third expert this afternoon is Rowena Hackwood. Rowena is the CEO of the David Ross Education Trust and is soon to take up her new role as CEO at Australia Academies Trust. Both trusts serve disadvantaged communities and Rowena's impact as a trust CEO has been important and very significant. 
Our fourth guest this afternoon is Unity Howard. Unity is a director of the New Schools Network, the organization and charity which supports the creation of new free schools. She is also responsible for the delivery of the Academy Ambassadors Programme. And last and certainly not least, our fifth guest this afternoon is Ed Vinker. Ed is co-founder and executive principal of Reach Academy Feltham. He is a member of the DFE Early Years Stakeholder Group and the Royal Foundation Steering Group on Early Life. I hope you'll agree we've gathered together a group this afternoon of people who have not only made a significant contribution in their professional careers, but also have a very clear role and opinion to state on this really important issue this afternoon. Before we start um, by asking Leora to talk for us, to us for a few minutes about her views on the topic this afternoon, let me just tell you how the rest of the session is going to work. So I will invite each of our experts to talk on the subject of this session for three minutes each. They'll all have a unique perspective and it will be an opportunity to reflect on their observations of the answer to this question. After all five have spoken, I will then come back to you, the audience, and invite you to consider any questions that you might have. And if you want to create a question, you can ask it by uploading it via the question and answer box at the bottom of the Zoom window screen. I will then do what all chairs do, as is their prerogative, and ask a couple of questions of my own to the panel before coming back to the audience and asking those selected questions that we've chosen to the panel. And then I'll bring us back together to close down the rest of this session, which we will finish at or shortly before 4.30 this afternoon. So I want us to now uh, hear from our panel. Um, and first of all, uh, Leora, if I could come to you, your three minutes opinion piece on this topic on disadvantage. Thank you very much, David. Um, it's a pleasure to join this panel this afternoon. Um, I want to approach this question by thinking about how schools are preparing to reopen. So a key theme in all conversations with executive and governance leaders that I've been having in the last 72 hours is the need to understand uh, the scientific and medical advice. Um, I think this is absolutely key to uh, our, our decisions around reopening. So why social distancing potentially looks different in the community than in schools, I think we need to feel confident about this um, as we are basing our detailed plans and our communications on this. We need to ensure that we are taking a participative approach. So in a recent blog by Russell Hobby, he says, science can tell us tentatively how different dates for easing the lockdown might affect deaths from the coronavirus. A separate branch of science can tell us how different dates for easing the lockdown might affect economic growth, which also affects mortality in the long run. This still doesn't tell you what date to ease the lockdown. He concludes by saying, to make decisions during this crisis and beyond the crisis, we need principles plus science. And I think this also goes to the heart of how we deal with the disadvantage gap. I thought Jenny Harris, England's Deputy uh, Chief Medical Officer, made a very uh, thoughtful contribution last night. She said, I think the point here is where are children going to flourish and to balance out the risks and opportunities we face. She invites us to think about some of the wider public health issues in relation to uh, reopening. And she asks us to consider what will happen over a child's lifetime. I find this very compelling. When we think about opening schools more widely, and we think about the impact of a deep recession on the most disadvantaged and the poorest children, we need to be taking the longer view. Thank you, David. Leora, that was fantastic. And, and I, I heard Jenny say that at, her, at the, um, the press conference earlier this week, where and how our children will flourish is such an important anchor point for us in this current time, isn't it? So thank you very much for starting that off. Ben, could I come to you next for your perspective on this? Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to join for this webinar. Um, so coronavirus is having a significant impact on people's lives all around the world. And I think that is particularly true in terms of education. Um, we're looking now at about 1.3 billion children in over 150 countries that are, that are currently out of school. 
My work is focused on international emergencies, particularly in countries in Africa and Asia, where I've seen firsthand how schools are often at the front line in responding to the needs of affected communities. This includes the continued delivery of vital education services, but also school feeding programs and the provision of safe spaces uh, where vulnerable children can feel protected. The stability that schools provide can be significant support for longer term recovery efforts. In emergencies, aid agencies will develop scenario planning, best, medium and worst case scenarios for how a crisis will evolve. Response plans then tend to focus on the most realistic or likely scenarios, but it is important to consider contingency plans should the worst case scenario happen. A maxim of, of aid work is hope for the best, prepare for the worst. As plans are developed to respond to the scenarios, and in the case of uh, this webinar today, we're looking ahead to when schools can reopen and having a longer term recovery plan in place, I'd like to share three key things that we often consider within emergency and recovery programs. One, risk management. Reflect on practical approaches to reduce the risk of transmission through ensuring, for example, access to and regular use of hand washing facilities, reduced class sizes and increased ventilation. Two, information and communication. Effective aid work relies on open and honest communication with communities. It's how aid agencies build trust. For schools and trust, you may want to consider different communication methods to ensure children, parents and communities understand health messaging and buy into recovery plans. And three, protect the most vulnerable. Because of COVID-19, disadvantaged children risk falling behind in their learning. They may experience increased stress, and the exacerbation of mental health issues. It will be crucial to ensure mechanisms are in place to identify and support the most vulnerable. Now, against these three factors, it's important to consider how ready your school or trust is and what steps may need to be taken to build capacity of your team. I'm sure you've thought of much of this already, but I hope reiterating some of the basics from relief work here is helpful. I'll stop there, thank you. Right, I'm going to um, step in and take the uh, chair just for the moment uh, from David. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks, Ben. It's really helpful to, to get a perspective from outside the sector. So I'm going to ask uh, Rowena next to offer her thoughts. You're on mute, Rowena. There you go. You'd think after a couple of weeks of doing this, I'd have got it cracked by now, but every single time. Anyway, there we go. Amateur mistake. I apologise, everybody. So um, thank you, Leora. And um, I just wanted to start by saying that we're seeing, I think, nationally a divergence in strategies that's be that are being taken by multi-academy trusts. Um, and without judging that either strategy is correct or not correct, I would ask you to think about what your intentional strategy is. Don't end up with one or the other by accident, but decide which direction you want to go in and go full on into that, into that direction because my experience is that a half-hearted attempt is likely to give us a half-hearted answer. What I'm seeing is that some trusts are recognizing that the real gap is around the academic deficit which is being built up during this period from a range of groups, we're expecting to see not only um, a disadvantage gap widening. I was today talking with my director of primary about a gender gap widening, for instance, and without wanting to speak in stereotypes, we are seeing um, a greater take of home learning from, primaries, uh, from, from girls um, in our primaries than we are from our boys, and that's something we're actively addressing at present. So we're seeing those trusts that are saying there is going to be a massive academic deficit, and there are those trusts that are saying, frankly, all bets are off academically next year. We've got a significant social, cultural and um, 
potentially also behavioral deficit, which is being built up, which is where they are saying that they want to focus. I do believe that you can do both of those two things, but I do feel it's quite interesting seeing those two different divergent strategies in responding to how schools are planning for their return, not only this summer, but also in September and thereafter. At my trust, we're taking a project management led approach and using those disciplines of project management that you would expect to see, which are increasingly commonly used in education. And we've split both our central teams and our head teacher teams into a now team and a next team. And the now team are working on behalf of all of our schools on planning for um, uh, our primary, current prim primary um, uh, academic working from home and so on, and managing our pastoral support and our next team planning for our return on behalf of everybody. And that's taken quite a change in thinking to essentially allow others to step in and take your, um, to step in and, and manage some of your planning for you. But it's been really important in managing teacher workload. We've been absolutely focusing at the David Ross Education Trust on creating the best possible home learning environment that we can and that we know that we have over 90% of students engaging with home learning at this point. Um, and that we think is the main way in which we can limit the disadvantage gap from growing as we move back towards a full restart in September. We have also looked at vulnerable children in a very broad definition of, of disadvantage. And we're inviting three times the definition of vulnerable children into our schools at present because we recognise that vulnerability isn't just determined by whether or not you have a social worker, but it can be all kinds of other types of vulnerability too. So we have significantly extended that definition of vulnerability to make sure that um, we are addressing as many gaps as we can before they start to emerge, um, rather than waiting until we have a problem and then trying to fix it. In terms of our return, we're going to be focusing on vulnerable children before the rest of the generality. But when all of our students return, our experience in terms of managing the disadvantaged gap, and I'm hoping that Ed might talk a little about this as well, is by focusing on consistent quality first teaching where every child is valued in the classroom and every child's progress, every minute of every lesson of every day is important. We are um, really seeking to ensure that the diet that we offer to our students when they return is focused, continues to be as rich as it can be, um, and really focuses on those deficits and filling those deficits back up as early as we possibly can, driven through a focus on quality first teaching. Thank you so much, Rowena. So Rowena, thank you very much indeed. Um, <laughs> I've got guys, I, 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 I I'm back with you at last. The gremlins have disappeared. Uh, Rowena, thank you for that. Unity, can I bring you in next? Yes. Hi. Thanks. Uh, thanks, David. Um, so, thinking about school reopening and the disadvantage gap, I just quickly wanted to do a quick summary of what we know now. So, prior to the pandemic, prior to the virus um, hitting the UK, um, Britain was already one of the worst uh, countries amongst developed nations uh, for social mobility. Um, the EEF has warned that as part of uh, uh, the school closures that have happened over the past couple of weeks that the attainment gap um, uh, will, uh, the, the, the progress on narrowing the attainment gap will be wiped out that has been made over a decade and day by day uh, that these that schools are closed this becomes worse. So that's what we know. There's so much that we don't know, but I think it's just important to acknowledge at this point what we do know and that the biggest impact this virus is going to happen is on children. The government is really asking school leaders to climb Everest with reopening schools. It's not as easy as shutdown. It's not as easy as clicking your fingers or just reopening. There are so many factors which, which Ed and Rowena will be much more um, competent to, to, to tell you about. Um, but I think it, it's worth recognizing that school leaders are the experts in their field in being able to do this there is no one else who will be able to to come in and say for each different school how to reopen what the process is what that will look like it's essential that the government provides a framework to do that but all of the things that, are, that school leaders are taking into consideration are so specific to their school so the pupil cohort the nature of their staffing the building model and so it's really important that we as a sector put faith in school leaders to undertake this planning uh, 
on their own. Um, so there's not going to be a one size fits all model here. But that being said, the only way through this virus is uh, and, and this planning for reopening is for the sector to come together and to collaborate. Ideas are going to come from the sector, they're going to come from teachers, they're going to come from leaders. We, the only way to learn and achieve collectively through this innovation is to collaborate um, with everyone. And I'll stop there. Unity, thank you very much indeed. That was, that was brilliant. Um, last but not least, Ed, welcome. Um, your thoughts on this? Thank you, yeah. Um, <clears throat> to pick up straight away on kind of what Rowena said, I, I'm very lucky. Um, the school that I founded in 2012 has been successful in large part because of um, my co-founder, Rebecca Kramer, who has who is an, a brilliant teacher and a brilliant leader and she throughout the last three or four weeks has been really pushing me on focusing on the core business when we come back to school so not first thinking about summer provision or thinking about our work with food banks but thinking about how we're going to make sure that our teachers are best positioned to teach great lessons to as many pupils as possible um, and, and delivering a really strong, excellent curriculum. And I think it's important to focus in on the core things that worked and have worked for us as, as, as we've closed the gap that Unity described in recent years. Um, and I think that that's really, really, that, that's the first piece and that's really critical. I think then it's true to say that schools are going to be in really in, in very, very different positions to adapt that provision in the light of what we're seeing. It seems to me that the quality of induction is going to be absolutely critical. So those first six to eight weeks um, and, and supporting pupils whenever they come back through that first phase is going to be critical. Um, and that will mean more pastoral support, stronger pastoral systems, more mental health and well-being support and stronger systems around that. The piece that I wanted to, to kind of add in that I think is really critical is, is around the support for families. And I think that the, the economic impact of this is going to take time to emerge and it's going to hit different, different families at different times. We've seen the food banks that we work with in Feltham go from um, 50 referrals to now 350 referrals a week very, very quickly. And, and I think we're also very close to Heathrow and we're seeing a lot of, a lot of um, people who've been furloughed where we're very concerned that their jobs may not be there when the furloughing ends. Uh, and it seems to me that the support around that and in particular the the awareness of where to access other support whether that's statutory or from the third sector will be a really important role for schools because we have those relationships we are trusted in communities and our ability to signpost effectively i think is going to be a critical part of our work with families as we go back thank you Ed, thank you very much indeed Ed, thank you very much indeed and, and thank you to all five of you for your insights, but also for keeping to time. Um, that's been noted. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, my comments are now for the moment addressed to the audience. We're going to, I'm going to ask a couple of questions myself, which will give us about 10 minutes to answer those. If there are questions that you would like to pose to the panel, then please use the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, we'll collect those up um, and, and in 10 minutes or so, I'll start putting some of those uh, to our panelists this afternoon, so we give the opportunity to feed some of your thoughts into this really important and stimulating debate. But my first question um, is this, uh, and, and I think it's a fairly basic one, but it's one that probably cuts to the heart of what a lot of us are thinking about at the moment, and it's this. Is there a new definition in a post-coronavirus era of what it means to be disadvantaged. And thinking, Rowena, about what you were saying a moment ago about broadening the definition of vulnerability, would you like to have a go at this first? Is there a new definition in this era of what it means to be disadvantaged? Uh, so I would say, I, I would say that there is, and I think we need to be very careful about what we mean by disadvantage because obviously there is a technical definition as well as a practical definition and every teacher will tell you that they can look around their class and this is something that we've discussed a lot during the um, lockdown period that every teacher can tell you that there are children who are not deemed disadvantaged who they feel are vulnerable at present and for whom there will be a long tail of legacy of the COVID-19 um, pandemic which will continue to um, mean that they are vulnerable in that very broadest sense um, and I'll give you an example of that during the um, lockdown period and a number of you have asked on the Q&A um, how it is we've maintained our very high level of engagement 
a lot of that's been driven by the amount of homeschool contact with every child having a phone call every week for every vulnerable child according to our definition having a phone call every day um, so this has resulted in about 15,000 phone calls a week about 11 and a half thousand to all students and that has revealed 140 new safeguarding cases that we would not have anticipated prior to COVID. So if we think about the effect of disadvantage and some of the manifestations of disadvantage, which might potentially um, emerge as safeguarding issues, we can see that there are new, um, uh, certainly the parameters of those children that we would otherwise deem disadvantaged are broadening beyond what we might um, have previously seen. So I would say in the main answer to the question, David, that the definition to some extent holds true, but the number of children and um, the range of children that fall into that disadvantaged bracket, I think is going to significantly increase. And we've also seen that through the increase in take up of free school meals during this period. Um, we know that an awful lot more children are now falling into that category than was previously the case. Thank you. Very Thanks, Serena. That's a really interesting uh, insight from the work that you're doing in, in, in both trusts, I think, in terms of thinking about how that works. Ed, could I come to you? Do you have any thoughts on this, the new definition? Is there a new definition? Yeah, I mean, I, it seems to me that one of the things about this whole period is how differently it's affecting different people and how those different kind of those different experiences reflect economic factors, kind of mental health factors, domestic, you know, home situations and so on. And so my reflection here is that I think as school leaders, we're going to need to be curious about um, our community and curious about the experiences they're having, which speaks to the conversations that Rowena's staff are having in their schools. And, and continue to be open to exploring what what different families, what different pupils have experienced, and the impact of that. I think I think I think that the, the family relationships are also really critical here. I mean, as I was, we were isolated at my home for three weeks um, with my children, nine and six, and um, we really, I really got on my kids' nerves. They were really, they kept telling me to stop doing my head teacher voice, stop trying to get them to do a particular type of learning, and I think. I think that complexity, I, you know, I, we, worked, we worked through it, but I think those family relationships have been really strained in a lot of cases with everything that's been going on. And I think we need to be curious about exploring the impact of that experience on our pupils, particularly, although not exclusively, our youngest pupils who are still building those strong attachments and secure attachments. Ed, I've, Ed, I've got a question from, um, from somebody in the audience, which I think is, this is the right moment to maybe to, to pitch it to you as well and the question is to what extent is closing the disadvantage gap not just a school and pedagogical issue but also one about community improvement yeah i mean i, I think it's real i think there's a there's a there's a there's an interesting moment and it kind of speaks to the di the, 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 the dichotomy that, that rowena opened up earlier I mean, I think schools are in very, very different positions, serving very, very different communities with um, communities that have social sectors that have different levels of richness and capacity and resource. I definitely think that schools are incredibly well positioned to play a, a more substantial than merely an academic role in those communities. And I think that that role has been seen um, over the last kind of two months, two and a half months. Um, schools have done much more than just um, provide online work. They've been that source of support for vulnerable families, for key worker families. They've distributed food. They've done all those things. And I think, I do think closing this gap in the next period will require um, institutions to work more closely together and I think schools can be a kind of a platform organization a signposting organization and schools working together can collaborate to bring resources to the most vulnerable it, especially in places where um, the, the local education authority or the kind of the, it doesn't necessarily have the same kind of level of geographical specificity that the community is used to. So I think there's a role for schools in terms of that kind of neighborhood level of change. Um, and I think that's something that where possible, I'm sure schools will be exploring and will also kind of come inevitably through the, everything that's been going on. Rowena, can I just come back to you for a second? Because the thought just occurs to me. I mean, you, you've talked about broadening the definition of vulnerability and, and almost tripling the number of children that might be applied to that. If that's true, 
do we even need a label for this? I mean, in this particular environment that we're in right now, is it not true to say that almost every child will be vulnerable in, in some regard? And, and that's what should be informing our strategies. Is that a fair way to look at it? Um, well, I think that is, that is one way of looking at it. And certainly in some of my most successful primaries, under normal circumstances, where disadvantaged pupils outweigh um, non-disadvantaged pupils, actually good quality teaching, a robust knowledge rich curriculum and effective behaviour management strategies are applicable to every child. They're not just singling out particular groups within the school community. And so, you know, in a sense, I suppose it's an extrapolation of that kind of idea. What I would say, though, is that there are some places within my system where you do see significant difference. So, for example, if I look at my um, one leafy secondary school out of 11, um, the issues there are not to do with um, engagement so much as to do with dealing with misconceptions as children plough forwards, engaging very well with home learning, but, um, uh, but encountering sort of misconceptions as they go. So what we have to do there is to think about when we get those year 10 and 12 children back in, is to how we unpick that, not how we get them at their desk learning in the mornings. Whereas there are other students for whom learning from home is simply an impossibility at present. and will have a bigger mountain to climb when they come back into school because they will have been longer out of a learning type of environment. So I think, yes, you're right in the macro sense, David, but I do think that there are significant differences. And this is one of the reasons why I'm actually very much in favour of what many have described as too loose a set of guidance around secondary schools for the return to school. But what I can see across my 11 secondaries is that whilst we're all working to the same principles in planning our, our partial return in June for years 10 and 12, each of our schools needs discretion to meet every student where they are in their learning and shape the um, offer that they put in place for those students quite differently, actually. So there, there will be differences between schools. I think those schools that are more heavily orientated towards disadvantage will find themselves in the situation that you described, David. That's really helpful. And looking at the questions that are coming in from the audience, I think these, this particular theme that we've just been exploring for the last few minutes with Rowena and, and, and with Ed are exactly the kind of issues that people are, are considering and, and, and are finding really helpful in terms of your responses. Let me go to my second question. And my second question is slightly different, but not that far away from the topic of the first. And it's this, how should we measure the effectiveness of the way that schools, their leaders, their teachers, their trustees and governance governors, how, how do we measure the effectiveness of how, the, how we assess the quality of the plan that is about reintegrating vulnerable children into school? Because we've addressed this afternoon already some of the real challenges around this and the role of leaders and trustees and governors is really important. Leora, have you thought about this one? Thank you, David. Yes. Uh, but before I answer your question, I just want to build on um, Ed's response about the responsibilities of schools and the uh, neighbourhood uh, level and the wider role of schools in, in communities. I think it is now clearer than ever that schools and trusts are civic structures. Um, and we, what we've seen through uh, the coronavirus period is schools behaving, schools and trusts behaving as um, civic partners to promote the value of the child in the local community and the value of education. So I just wanted to pick up on that. So in answer to your specific question, I'm not sure we should be measure, measuring the effectiveness of schools and trusts to reintegrate vulnerable children. I'm not sure measurements are that helpful at, at the moment because they're just so many variables. Um, and we don't have a secure uh, evidence base to all of this, uh, frankly. None of, this, none of us have done anything like this in our lifetimes before, and I hope we'll, we'll not again. So perhaps the best thing that we can do is to seek to understand what evidence there is. And the EEF is um, helpfully pulling together a rapid review of the evidence. So then in true Ambition Institute style, I think we should take a best bets approach. Um, and I think this picks up on the points that Rowena was making. So if by reintegrating vulnerable children or disadvantaged children into school, we mean addressing gaps in their learning, then the best bet is both intensive teaching in the way that Rowena has suggested and responsive teaching in the way that Dylan William talks about. First, that's the first thing. Secondly, I think we, we do need to support them uh, more widely in the way that Ed has discussed. So I think in that case, the best bet is to reintroduce them into the safe 
and known routines of school life. So um, I recently wrote a blog uh, for, for Challenge Partners in, in which I cited um, Anne Maston writing, writing in The American Psychologist in, in 2001. She says the study of resilience in development has overturned many negative assumptions and deficit focused models about children growing up in the threat of disadvantage and in adversity. The most surprising conclusion emerging from these studies is the is these children uh, from these children is the uh, ordinariness of resilience so her conclusion is that resilience is made up of ordinary the ordinary processes of school rather than extraordinary processes she calls this ordinary magic so i think we need to harness the ordinary magic of schools strong purposeful teaching a planned curriculum in the way that rowena has said powerful welfare and pastoral systems in the way that Ed has described. Vera, thank you very much for that. Unity, when you spoke uh, in your three minute slot, uh, I really liked what you said about the way in which we need to use collaboration a lot in the future here to share some of the thinking that's going around the system. Is understanding what's working in the system about how we reculture and reinduct young people and staff back into schools, is that an example of what you meant about collaboration? Yes, absolutely. So I think to, to, to slightly just take your words question before in terms of measures, I think what we need to be really careful about is trying to fit the next term, the next academic year into kind of pre coronavirus language, because it, it's not clear at all that any of the existing measures that we're used to are the right ones right now. But that def, def, definitely doesn't mean that the aims shouldn't be kind of junked. Um, so it, yes, as I, as I was saying at the beginning, I think it's really important that um, we use the next term uh, at least for school leaders um, to allow uh, to allow school leaders to develop their own approach to reinducting pupils, to what exactly their teaching, to their methods of teaching, to the pastoral support, to the um, welfare and, and the community work as well. And then being able as a sector to admit, we don't know everything right now, let's let let's see what happens let's see what the experts come up with and then learn from each other uh together thank you both for that question my my third question um ben i'm going to come to you if i may uh, for this one and, and it's this what role do you think schools have to play in the regeneration of communities in a post-pandemic era thanks very much um as I said in my earlier uh, comment, you know, schools do provide vital support for longer term recovery and regeneration efforts following a crisis. And I think that how schools engage with communities on this issue is really important. On that point, again, drawing on my experience from, from relief programs, um, it may be useful, I think, to consider uh, a few things. Firstly, um, does your school trust have a plan in place for engaging with communities? Um, in West Africa during the Ebola response of 2015, just for example, uh, many schools set up back to school campaigns within communities, as well as catch up and accelerated learning support for returning pupils. At the same time, you might want to consider some form of continued distance education to run in parallel, so as to enable some degree of additional learning for pupils and ongoing support for teachers. Um, something actually that Ed um, mentioned that really struck me was um, how important it was to be curious about our communities and what they've experienced. And I think that, that that's absolutely, absolutely key. And it actually brings me on to my second point, which was on building support from communities through clear information exchange. And that could be around looking at, you know, are feedback mechanisms in place and do they capture the opinions and ideas of communities? How will any feedback actually be properly considered and acted upon? Uh, and is social media being used effectively in this regard? And then thirdly, I think it, we've mentioned a lot about, about plans and I think it's about also how that plan is managed going forward as a school or a trust. Um, what is the, 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 the structure, the process in place to manage and monitor plans going forward? Are you making the best use of your, your staff? Do, you, uh, do they need further support or training uh, to adapt to, the, to this change in situation? And lastly, 
I would suggest, you know, keep in mind that the situation is an evolving one, and that will be felt very much within communities. As more information becomes known, we'll want to update and refocus plans accordingly. And, and therefore, therefore, I think it's really important to be prepared to be flexible. Flexible if risks and therefore priorities change accordingly. Uh, I'll leave it there. Many thanks. Ben, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, thank you to all five of you for uh, the, uh, the depth of the answers that you gave me in, in, with, with so little time to think about that. I want to go now to some of the audience questions because we've got some fantastic um, examples of the way that people are thinking about this. Um, and I think to try to get as many of these through as possible in the time, I'm going to direct the questions that I've got in front of me to individual panel members so that we can get as many done in the next 10, 50 minutes as possible. Um, Rowena, the first question I think probably comes for you actually. Um, and we've been asked a question about how are you addressing the gender gap, uh, the performance and the the understanding of what we need to be doing for boys and girls differently in our schools? So I don't, I, I might actually um, defer this question to Ed um, as a more seasoned educator than me. Um, but, um, but certainly our strategies as a trust were, have been long in place. We've long had a gender gap and this is a national issue. Um, particularly uh, we've seen reading and writing gaps. We've generally speaking have girls outperforming boys, particularly at key stage two SATs. Um, we often have girls outperforming boys um, in phonics and early reading. So this is not a new issue. This is about a home engagement issue that the way that we are trying to crack it during this period um, is, um, I suppose, in a lot of ways, quite similar to how we seek to um, crack it at other points. The, the key thing at present is about the level of engagement that we have with home, because um, very often, um, and I'm a mother of four boys, so I can speak from a bit of personal experience with the kind of ants in their pants, trying to, we were only trying to get them to sit down and do some kind of craft project. Genuinely, that has been the bane of my life. Um, you know, I do understand as, as a parent that that can be very difficult. It can be very difficult to find ways for motivating boys to learn from home, if you'll forgive me for speaking in generalities. Um, and we have found that giving parents the opportunities to speak with educators about the strategies that they are using in the classroom, or they would be using if they were teaching um, both boys and girls, that has been the key thing that has increased our level of engagement during this period of time. Um, so, as I said earlier on, every child every week has a call home from their class teacher. Every vulnerable child has a call home every single day so that we can be not only looking at the data that we're able to gather from my child at school, from Google Classroom and so on, about um, the sort of the digital, digital um, recording of engagement with learning, but we can also talk with parents about the problems and the barriers that they're having in getting their children to engage. But I wonder, David, if I might defer to um, educators around the table here um, to share some more specific strategies, or indeed if anyone would yes. like to get in touch with me um, afterwards, I'm very happy for my contact details to be shared and I can connect you up with my, um, my education team who'll be able to cover it better than me. No, that that was a great uh, that was a great attempt at a, at, a, at a tricky question. Ed, do you want to come in at that point? Yeah, I mean, the the, the only thing I would add, I think, is that that if if we think about that gender gap, I think I think the quality of feedback has been is really has been key um, to making sure that um, we have you know really high levels of engagement, full stop, but particularly with our boys. Um, and so we are we've been using our support staff. Um, so we have our we have our videos and when, then when and then pupils complete their work in an exercise book and then they they or their parents take a photo of the work and email it to our support staff to our teaching assistants and the teaching assistants then give some feedback you know give feedback on that and and we've been able to incorporate the, that work and examples of that work into the future videos and I think that has made a big difference so I think it's it's a matter of um, of, of, of being kept in mind, of being understood, of being seen. And I think that, that the, the, kind of, the kind of personal engagement that Rowena was talking about, coupled with, I think, some direct feedback in a sense that they're not kind of working into a void, I think is, is important. Thank you very much, Ed. That's really helpful. Um, I, I'm absolutely delighted that in the audience this afternoon, we have quite a high number of colleagues who are governors and trustees uh, and, and board members, both at the academy board and trust level. 
Uh, and this is a question that I think that is very pertinent at the moment about their role. And Leora, I'll come to you first, if I may. What role do you think trustees and governors can play in addressing this particular issue about uh, disadvantage and tackling the gaps as we see more children coming back into school? So uh, this is absolutely a, a, a role um, for those responsible uh, for, for governance, um, particularly as we open schools more widely. Um, David, I'd like to make a general point about the role of governance in opening schools more widely. So I, I think there, um, there might be some uh, confusion on this issue. Um, in CST's view, it is absolutely essential that the decision to open schools more widely and each, if in, within a multi-academy trust, each site is taken at trust board level uh, by those responsible for governance, by the legal entity and by the employer. Uh, so there's a really very significant role um, for governance uh, here. I think that needs to be done on the basis of really thorough um, risk assessments um, and um, the production of protocols for staff uh, to follow and the demonstration of a due process. So how your trust board has made the best possible decisions to keep pupils and adults in your school um, as, as, as safe as possible. Um, and then with, within that context, I think that um, it's the role of governance to um, monitor the, uh, the, the, the significant impacts um, that will um, befall schools and trusts in this period, um, both the financial impacts and the educational impacts. So if we're going to have resilient governance going forward in this period, it is imperative that uh, trust boards put in place processes to, to do that. We've just published um, a decision-making framework uh, for trust boards to enable them to make the best possible decisions, both in the short term, as we plan to reopen schools, but also in the longer term to monitor those uh, financial and educational impacts. Leora, are the two documents that you just made reference to on the CSD website? Uh, I, th I think, um, I think they might be behind the paywall. What I, I will check that and what I will do as a consequence of, um, of, of this webinar is I will put them in front of the paywall so that they can be available for all. That's incredibly helpful. Thank you very much. Um, ben, I'm going to come to you for the next question, partly because I think it, it teases something that you talked about in your three minutes earlier in the session. And the question that has come forward is this. As teachers, do we focus on addressing the social and economic effects of lockdown as much as we do on the academic deficit? Thanks very much. Um, I mean, that's a good question. And in many ways, I think it's a tough ask of, of, of teachers in schools to do that. I think within, within crisis context, what, what, we, what we see is um, uh, a, a range of different needs and risks emerging, both perhaps the, the, the immediate ones on education and then broader socioeconomic ones. And I think what that really calls for is um, uh, strong collaboration of something that, 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 that Unity mentioned earlier, which I, which I completely agree with. How you know, various different stakeholders within society, within the community can come together. And on that, absolutely, I think, I think school leaders, schools and trusts have, have, a, have a vital role to play as part of a of, of a bigger process as part of a bigger initiative uh, i spoke earlier around um examples i've seen around around the world where in crises um schools and the engagement of schools can uh, really help build resilience and, and and stability after a crisis and that speaks a lot i think to um strengthening uh, and addressing rather uh, economic and, and, and social concerns yes that speaks to perhaps the most at risk and the most vulnerable, but it also speaks to about trying to um, support longer term recovery efforts as a, as a whole. And that, that, that speaks to supporting children, pupils, students, parents, um, uh, teachers, wider community as well. So I think it's very much about collaboration. And within that, um, absolutely, there is, there is a key role um, to be played by, by, by school leaders. And, and, and we see that frequently in, in my experience in overseas um, contexts where because of their engagement with the community, their standing in the community, um, they have a really important role to play. Thank you very much indeed, Ben, for that. 
Um, fourth question I want to pose, uh, and Ed, I think I'm probably going to come in your direction with this one, if that's okay, because I think you've talked a little bit about this this afternoon. But the question is this, what other interventions other than high quality teaching do you feel would be valuable in this context? Um, I think I think that my answer to that would would be to stay away from the academic. I'm gonna my answer is gonna stay away from the academic because I think that that would be where I would really focus the kind of the beginning of the kind of the the school the, the teachers kind of response as to making sure the classroom is as successful as it possibly can be for all pupils. I think I'm I'm very very preoccupied about um, our communities. Um, domestic situations, um, financial, and so on, and and the, the isolation that is being experienced by many, many people. Um, it was amazing. We surveyed our families, and a third of our families said that if they had had to isolate, they didn't have a support network who could help them to, um, to, 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 go, to get through that. Um, and I think one of the things that, that we've seen that has been very powerful and kind of picking up on Ben's point has been the leadership that um, our parent community have taken on in this period um, and just before. Um, one of the kind of breakthrough things that we've done in the last kind of six months is to be part of setting up a Citizens UK um, organization in Hounslow. And the, the, the community leadership that that has um, brought out has been fantastic. And so we have parent, different people um, in our community, different parents in our community emerging in different where we give different opportunities and where there are where there are different moments so um, with Citizens UK that has been some campaigning work some listening work creating networks we've we've trained some of our parents to deliver um, uh, peep um, sessions around the home learning environment and they have gone on now to start foundation degrees this September um, and then in this period we've got a, a group of parents more dads not surprisingly who've really embraced the kind of practical opportunities to support delivering food and um, supporting with with that side of things and so I think I would be encouraging schools to find opportunities to kind of unleash the the kind of the, the power and the and the and the um, and the capacity within the community and within the communities we serve the last question that i think we've got time for this afternoon i want to give each one of you an opportunity to answer it so the answers need to be quite pithy um, and maybe i'll go down the panel in the same order that you spoke leora first then ben then Rowena, then Unity, and then Ed. And the question is this, how do we make best use of children's inherent resilience and natural appetite for learning when planning for reintegration? Leora, do you want to start that? So unmute. Um, David, I'm just saying, I think, um, I, I, think I, I answered that question. Um, I think it's really important that we reintroduce uh, children young people into the routines of school and we get them uh, learning again. Um, it, 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 it is this ordinary magic concept that I, I referred to. What I am deeply suspicious of actually is layering complexities onto schools uh, in the widening more op op open, uh, opening more widely period so that um, you know we, what we don't need now for schools is lots and lots of initiatives uh, to implement on top of um, getting children back into schools, keeping them safe, um, making sure their welfare uh, is protected and, and getting them back uh, into learning through intensive and responsive teaching. Um, so, so, so I think, it's, I think it's, it's that, what I previously called the ordinary magic. Very helpful. Um, ben, fair question? Uh, thanks, uh, I, I very much agree with that. Um, and I, I think, you know, there's this incredible resilience that, that, that children and pupils have. And I think it's very much around recognizing them as, if I can borrow a term from the aid world, you know, key stakeholders within this, putting them very much at the center of this, of, of the planning um, for, for recovery. Um, engaging with them through a variety of different communication methods, depending on their circumstances, um, and how to bring in their ideas, bring in their engagement, their, their, their feedback into this, into this process to strengthen it, 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 it going forward, to make sure that they're, they're, they're engaged in the learning and it's the right learning and they're, and they're um, very much part of the, 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 the development of the, re the recovery process going forward. Thank you. Rowena. 
Well, I think this is a very tricky question, David, and thank you for that. Um, I think uh, we know that there are a lot of very exuberant children who are very excited to come back to school, actually. And um, we've got to find the right way of getting them back in the right time, which keeps both staff um, and our students um, safe. Our plan is to look at getting children back into learning as soon as they get into school, but managing a gradual reintegration so that we're not having a sort of a day one big bang kind of um, uh, everybody back in and assuming everything is going to be just like it was before in the same way that we always have to work on the learning routines um, around our schools and our readiness to learn within our schools. We know that we're going to have to reset those parameters when children come back to school. And we know that through doing that through tried and tested methods, we will accelerate children back into the normal routines of learning. And the more consistency that we can have through our standardized strategies around things like behavior management, um, the quicker we will be at getting children um, back into sort of unlocking that curiosity for learning that we know is there. Um, we're just going to have to handle that exuberance when they're coming back into the building after a period where their parameters and um, the uh, rules by which they live may not have been quite so, so strong. Unity. Um, thanks. I, so I would echo quite a lot of the comments that have, have been made. I think, look, number one, we've got to get kids back into school. Number two, you've got to establish the routines that they are used to and make sure that you are kind of building the learning and, and getting them re-engaged. I think within that, there is a lot of difference. And Rowan has picked up on this, but um, the impact on different children in terms of them, their mental health is going to be significant, not least those that will have experienced bereavement, but those that will have experienced, as Ed picked up, the, um, the domestic situation and how that's influenced, um, influenced their in engagement with learning. So I think get, let's get them back in school and let's get them learning again. But I think the main thing is to focus on these children are experiencing different things. The routines are important, but some difference and, and flexibility is going to be essential for children. Ed, never easy to go fifth with the same question, but uh, anything to add? I think the one thing I would say is I think, I think one of the things that I'm really focused on is, is, is keeping in mind those pupils who aren't able to come back to school for different reasons and being thoughtful about how to make sure that they are, they, they, they have, a, they have an, a learning experience and again that they're held in mind and that their experience is, is thought about and is recognised and so that's something that we'll be focusing on. So like many of you who've been listening to the last hour, um, I've been scribbling frantically some of the ideas that I've heard. Um, and, and I think there are five themes uh, that have been made this afternoon, which, which if I was now going back into my trust or my school next week to think about would be really helpful to me. I think the first one was when we talked about the need to combine the principles with the science. I thought uh, when, we, when Laura talked about that from, from Russell Hobby's piece, I thought that was a really sensible blend of both the, the, the head and the heart side of thinking. I think Rowena's point about the breadth of definition um, around what we mean by uh, vulnerability um, and how we think about that in the broadest possible way as part of reintroduction as well as teaching and learning. Um, I like Unity's point about collaborating and learning from each other. I think one of the roles that Ambition Institute has to play here is to be the be the hovercraft above the system, gathering up some of this great thinking that people in schools are doing and sharing it as widely as we can. I'm very mindful about the quality of reinduction and the quality of reculturing for children and for staff in this first phase that we're about to go into. Um, and then point to both Ed and Ben made about support for families um, and the economic, the, sorry, the economic impact in particular on vulnerable families uh, is going to be something that's going to be quite significant. The one question I didn't pose, and I did it quite deliberately, was this. Um, there are questions asked about how you adapt your curriculum to make up for lost learning. Um, and the reason I didn't uh, pose that one this afternoon is that Marie Hamer, one of my colleagues at Ambition Institute, will be taking this as the theme for her roundtable in a few weeks' time. So it may be of interest to people to look at the website, look at the themes around the summer series, uh, and see which one Marie is doing and whether that's something that you'd like to, to join us for. But before we close uh, and before the weekend starts, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Over 400 of you have, uh, have registered and taken part, but I'm especially grateful to our five panel members uh, for their brilliant and their insightful contributions. 
Above all, I really hope that this session was useful. Uh, we're going to be sharing some follow-up reading on the website and through our Twitter account. So do check it out if you want to delve further into effective online teaching. Um, in addition to the system leadership programs I've already mentioned uh, earlier this afternoon, attendees on the call might be interested in the Ambitions Future Leaders program, uh, which I've had the pleasure of supporting for many years. Um, and I know many fantastic heads who've come through the program are now leading disadvantaged schools with exceptional skills and integrity. And the deadline for future leaders applications is the 9th of June. So do take a look at the website if you're interested. Um, and as I'll start where I finish, which is this is part of the summer series. It's, number, it's the second one, um, the program of webinars that we're running throughout the summer to support you. The next one is on June the 22nd. It's on how to assess and meet pupils' needs and is going to be led by Harry Fletcher Wood and the details are on the website. Uh, and last but not least, it's been great sharing time with you this afternoon. Thank you for everything that you're doing. These are unprecedented times, as many people are saying, but the work that we're seeing on the front line, our leaders, our teachers, our governors, our trustees is exceptional. Please let us know what you're doing on Twitter. If you have any feedback or further questions, those details are on the screen now. And if you've been following this this afternoon, you'll see that many people have already made a contribution. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much for joining us.